Our scripture today comes from the very beginning of Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Let us listen to God's word to us today. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our fellow beloved servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? The Lord our God, may your word be a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Through our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. As I mentioned in the announcements earlier, this coming Friday morning, a group of 23 individuals from this church will travel to the Estado 29 orphanage outside of Ensenada, Mexico. And I know I've mentioned previously uh, in this pulpit before that I had the amazing privilege to live in that community a year, the year after I graduated from college. It would be hard to overestimate how formative that time was for my life which is why I think it tends to show up a lot when I preach. But I was thinking about that time this week because when I lived there between 2003 and 2004 for that year, I had no cell phone. Yes, no cell phone. You heard correctly, no cell phone. And I didn't die, which is the thing. (laughs) There was also no internet that I could use with any convenience. If I wanted to check email, I had to take a bus into town that would take about half hour to 45 minutes where I would have to pay at an internet cafe by the hour. So not super convenient. There was a landline at the orphanage, but I only used that to talk with my parents once a week because it was not inexpensive. The main form of communication I relied on in those days to stay in touch with people back home was handwritten letters. But it was a little convoluted because I had to provide an address of of a man in Southern California whom I knew and whose organization made monthly trips to the orphanage. So friends and family would mail to him and then he would bring it down when he would come once a month. So on the month that those groups would arrive, I would eagerly await their arrival and stare at the gates looking for the familiar sight of the white van as they would pull through the gates. And after they had unloaded their stuff and greetings were exchanged, my unofficial mail courier would hand me a manila folder full of mail from home and I would tear into it like a child on Christmas morning. Now, I'm sure many of you continue the practice of writing handwritten letters. And I would say, please continue to do so. What an amazing gift it is, as Jenny shared with the children, to receive handwritten letters. I wish I could say I have continued the practice. I have not (laughs) continued that practice. It really is becoming a lost art. Uh, And now some of you in this room maybe have never written a letter in your life, nor do you intend to. 
But I will say this about the practice, what I so appreciated about it was that it forced me to take my time and, and to craft a message to whomever I was writing. It required far more thought and intentionality than my instant communications these days do. In letters, you have to make your words count. You can't waste a single word. So when we come to a book like Colossians, I think it's important to remember that fundamentally it was a letter written to a specific community at a particular point in time. Now that maybe seems like stating the blatantly obvious, but it fascinates me to think about that for a moment. Because imagine if you were part of the early Christian movements in the first century. There would have been no New Testament as we know it today. Uh, there wouldn't have been a whole complete Bible with uh, the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament compiled in one volume. Perhaps you would have heard stories about Jesus shared and passed down orally. Maybe you would have experienced some early gospel texts. In fact, many scholars suppose that the Colossian church would have been familiar with Luke's gospel because Luke is mentioned in the, at the end of Colossians. There also wouldn't have been anything yet like an organizational structure to the church. And so your only connection to what God was doing in the rest of the church and probably your best sense of guidance on how to be the church in your place and time arrived by means of these letters. So in Colossians, like the other letters of the New Testament, the stakes are so incredibly high, both for the author Paul and the community in the Colossian church. Paul, who, by the way, wrote this letter from prison, needed in limited space to communicate the very most important aspects of the gospel and to speak directly into their situation. And the Colossians, they needed continued instruction in the faith because many, if not all of them, are Gentile converts to the Christian faith. So they're new to the faith and they also probably lack the, the general sense of background of how the Jewish faith has informed this new movement within Judaism. And so imagine the excitement when word gets around this fledgling church community. A letter has arrived from the Apostle Paul. It would have been a momentous occasion. The author Rachel Held Evans in her book Inspired, uh, Rachel Held Evans, an author who tragically passed away earlier this year, she imagines what such a scene may have looked like as she narrates a fictional, though plausible, scene at a neighboring church in Laodicea, which was near Colossae, and it's mentioned in Colossians 4 simply as the church that meets in Nympha's house. She writes the following, The sun has set over Laodicea, but Nympha's house glows with lamplight and hums with the comforting sounds of stifled laughter and hushed conversation. As soon as Aelia and Drusilla slip through the back door and into the crowded atrium together, they sense a stirring. There is news. What has happened? Drusilla asks. Tychicus arrived from Colossae, whispers a young widow, with a letter from Paul. At this, Aelia's heart leaps, for it means she gets to listen to Nympha read. It mesmerizes her every time, the way Nympha enunciates every syllable carefully gently, sometimes pausing to explain the meaning of the more difficult words or ideas, or to laugh forgivingly when one of the children throws a tantrum. Many at the gathering are women, slaves, and poor laborers, unable to read the letters from the apostles on their own. Though a few are wealthy tradesmen, the owners of sprawling households, a passerby would find it strange to see them sitting together for a meal, master breaking bread with his slave, a wealthy patroness pouring wine for a poor prostitute. But this is what makes them different. This is what makes them Christians. What an amazing reality and a, and a beautiful reality that a letter written 2,000 years ago to people with specific stories, struggles, and circumstances that we will never know 
should continue to be read and heard by us today with our own stories, struggles, and circumstances. As we journey through this dynamic letter over the next several weeks, I think we need to attune our ears in a couple of ways. Because Paul, as I mentioned in the, in the practice of writing letters, you can't waste words, and Paul definitely does not waste any words. Along the way, uh, we will find so many references that we might wonder, what is he talking about? As a first century Jew, he is constantly drawing upon images, metaphors, and concepts from ancient Israel. And so we need to have our ears attuned to the Hebrew scriptures and how Paul is echoing them. Don kind of hinted at this last week, uh, but the second way we need to attune our ears is to pick up on the politically subversive language of Colossians, which really is a feature of the whole New Testament. We often forget, or at least fail to acknowledge, that so many of the words that we so closely associate within the lexicon of the church, that those words were just as commonly used outside of the church to refer to general life under the rule of an empire. So last week, Don mentioned the word Lord, and in the Greek, that word, uh, which became so crucial for the early church, continues for us today. Well, that word was just as commonly used to refer to the emperor. And so when the church proclaimed that Jesus is Lord, it was to say that Caesar is not. Consider three words prominent in the text today. First, the word peace. Well, one of the most powerful and pervasively propagated myths of the Roman Empire was that they were divinely appointed to usher in an unprecedented era of peace, as history refers to it as the Pax Romana. This myth infused every aspect of culture so that everyone knew Rome was responsible for the peace they enjoyed in their daily lives. But sadly and ironically, this peace came at the cost of unprecedented and widespread violence. Or consider the word gospel, which means good news. In the first century, this word could have just as easily been referring to the news that an heir to the throne of the emperor had been born. It was not just a word used by the church. And lastly, the word kingdom a concept that Jesus talked about more than anything else in the Gospels. We hardly need to use our imagination to pick up on the parallels. Jesus announced and Paul further explains and explores the presence of a kingdom that arrived in Jesus uh, into a world in which that same word was used to refer to an already existing and quite powerful kingdom. And these few words just scratch the surface of how the church co-opted and subverted language that was in service to the empire. But what the church did is they, they took those words and they repurposed them and redirected them in service and in worship to the God revealed in Jesus Christ and his kingdom. From the get-go, then, even in this introductory passage to the letter, we need to have our ears attuned in both directions. The letter begins after some introductions with these words, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Grace and peace. I was curious about this phrase, and so I looked throughout the rest of the New Testament and how the letters began, and in almost every single letter, and definitely all of them that are attributed to Paul, include this greeting, grace and peace, with only slight variation. So why did the pairing of grace and peace become such a distinctive greeting in the language of the New Testament? And then later on, as the worship and liturgy in the church developed, why did that become such a foundational greeting? Grace and peace. It has to be more than just a fancy way to say hello, right? As a greeting, what I think the words grace and peace do, is they reach out to a fellow Christian brother or sister, and they tell our story in just two words. I think grace and peace and it could be thought of as shorthand for the story we find ourselves in. Grace recalls God's faithful action in the past, and peace 
points forward to the future that God has promised to bring about. In some ways, I think what Paul does in his letters is just further and further expand on these two words. So when Paul uses the word peace... Even though he writes in Greek, he can't help but intend and evoke the meaning of the Hebrew shalom. Shalom is more than just well-being. It's more than just the absence of conflict. Authors Brian Walsh and Sylvia Kiesmat describe the biblical concept of shalom as blessing, richness, abundance, and a far-reaching harmony that permeates and characterizes all of our relationships. And I think this begins to make sense of the choice of metaphor Paul uses three times in the span of verses 6 through 10. Paul is so grateful that the gospel is bearing fruit in the whole world and growing and grateful that specifically it's bearing fruit within this little church. His prayer for them as they continue to grow in wisdom and understanding is that they would lead lives worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work. You can hear in this metaphor echoes of this abundance, of this growth, of this, of this life that is ever expanding, of this shalom. And in this metaphor, we should hear echoes of the very first command in Scripture when God blessed humanity and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Peace, though recalling this Genesis story and this, this vision of Eden, of completeness, it's a future-oriented concept because humanity has never known this all-encompassing well-being because we've consistently been part of the problem and consistently failed to make that kind of a world. But that is where grace comes in. The only way for that deep peace to come that Paul speaks of is for God to intervene Peace is therefore rooted in grace, and grace is the free radical gift of God. Paul speaks about this grace in so many different ways throughout his writings, but here in Colossians in verses 13 and 14, he says it this way, God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, what God has accomplished in the death and resurrection of Christ is nothing less than a cosmic rescue mission. And the language he uses here is language of deliverance, which echoes another important Old Testament story of Exodus. What God has done is he has freed humanity from the powers of sin and evil, powers both seen and unseen, and transferred us safely into the kingdom that God has established in Jesus Christ, an alternative kingdom to the kingdoms and powers of the world. Paul will continue to riff on grace and peace throughout the rest of the letter, and he will address particular issues and concerns in this community. As we move through this letter in our own context, I think it's important for us to think about and reflect on what the powers are that lay claim in our own lives and in our own day. And in the face of them, may we have the conviction to reclaim the grace of God, the free radical gift of God's grace that comes to us in Jesus Christ. And may that grace shape our lives toward a world of all-encompassing peace in every aspect of our lives. Grace and peace be to you. Amen.